We'll do that in heaven, but here on earth, we're a little more constrained by time, so uh, we will move on. Uh, do want to point out something important. If you received or if you grabbed one of the um, Sunday handouts, you'll find in the bottom right corner is some information about a uh, need, a benevolent need that we are wanting to meet here at First Christian Church to help out uh, one of our families. Now, more details are in it uh, in our e-newsletter that, um, that was emailed out on Friday, but I know a number of you don't uh, may either not get that or you get it, but you don't read it. So this has a lot more information. We'd like to help this family out with this need. And so directions for giving uh, to that and meet that need are uh, on the handout. You also, of course, have the message outline in the back of the handout. And if you are visiting with us here at First Christian Church for the first time, we are grateful and we're glad that you are here. We're going to encourage you, there's a connect card right in front of you in the pew rack in front of you. I'd love for you to fill that out and then come meet me at the end of the service today. I hang out in the back hallway when we're done. I'd love to get to say hello to you, talk to you a little bit, get to know who you are. And I've got a special gift that I would like to give to you for visiting us today. So thank you for being with us. Now, for the past month here at First Christian Church, we have been studying a letter that the Apostle Peter wrote to Christians who at that time had been scattered throughout the Roman Empire due to the increased persecution that the first generation of Jesus' followers experienced. These believers had to flee their homes. They had to leave businesses behind. They were alienated by family members for following Jesus. But here's the thing, they also carried the message of redemption through Jesus with them wherever they went. And so one of the chief ways, the key ways that the gospel spread in that first generation was because of the persecution, because these Christians had to scatter and flee their hometowns. Well, last week we began a section of this letter where Peter addresses how we are to respond to people in authority over us, particularly those who are in authority over us that are unfair or cruel or abusive. We all run into that, and certainly in Peter's day, his listeners dealt with people who were in authority that were unfair, cruel, and abusive. And surprisingly, Peter doesn't tell us to fight back. But instead, he tells us to submit. Submit to governing authorities, we read last week. Submit to overbearing bosses, we studied last week. And admittedly, the word submit is a tough one for us to swallow in the 21st century, especially when we speak of submitting to unfair, harsh, and abusive authority. But we learned last week that submitting to authority is simply doing the best that we can to function under the leadership of those who are over us, even if that person is abusing his or her authority. As Christians, as followers of Christ, we are to be as cooperative and willingly agreeable to the best that we can be. So as Peter pointed out toward the end of chapter 2, Jesus is our example regarding our response to cruel and harsh authority. And we do this not for our sake, Peter said, but we do this for the Lord's sake. For it is God's will that we honor him by living cooperative agreeable, non-contentious lives. Now, in chapter 3, where we pick up today, Peter continues for us this discussion of submission and of cooperation, of being agreeable and not contentious. And he comes to a sensitive topic. He comes to the topic of wives who have become Christians ahead of their husbands. For some reason, the gospel message often finds more receptive hearts among females than it does among males. 
So we often see, even today, ladies who are part of a church whose husbands are resistant to the gospel. And for some, this is a really difficult section of scripture to swallow that we're going to look at today. Especially because of some of the words that Peter chooses to use in discussing how particularly a wife is to relate to her unbelieving husband. Now, if you're not in a situation to say, well, I'm not married or my, my, my spouse is a believer, I've been married, I'm not married now, Wh whatever your situation is, you're going to find that there are some really, really good principles throughout this text that will help us. And so uh, please don't check out, uh, or, or if you're watching on, on video, please don't hit the remote and go to some other, uh, uh, other preacher. This is important, and you're going to see we're gonna, we're gonna go, where we're going to go with this. Now, a young man was contemplating marriage. And so he asked his grandfather how it was that he and grandma had stayed married for over 50 years. The grandfather told his grandson, he said, well, we have lived by a principle that grandma came up with early in our marriage. If it were a little or small decision, she would make it and I'd be okay with it. And if it was a big decision, I would make it and she'd be okay with it. And in 50 years of marriage, there have never been any big decisions. <laughs> now, keep in mind, as we, we read through and as we teach on this section, that while the principles of God are timeless, and the principles of God are never changing, the words that the biblical writers use to flesh out those principles often were more relatable to the original culture of people that were going to read this material than they may be to you and I living some 2,000 years after this letter was first penned. So let's listen to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Then... Even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They put their trust in God and accepted the authority of their husbands. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. In the same way, you husbands, must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. All right, again, if you are not married, Please listen up because this passage, as I'm going to show you as we go through this, isn't really about marriage. It is much as it is about how we as God's children are to influence and impact people in our lives who are not believers. Now, we all have people in our lives who are not believers. So this passage really has some important things to say to every single one of us, no matter what your marital status is. In this section, I, I, just as he used governing authorities and, and slaves and masters in chapter 2, he's just using marriage as, a, as another example of a relationship that, that we find ourselves in, where the person that we're in this relationship with, whether it be in a governing authority, a, a workplace environment, a home environment where they may not share the same truth and the same belief uh, and the same passion for Jesus that you, it, you feel. And so what Peter is really doing here is he's simply telling us, here is how you can have an impact and an influence on people in your lives 
who have not yet come to Jesus. Now, in this section, and as I probably imagine when it was going through it, there was probably three or four words that you may have cringed at. Uh, you may have had a hard time accepting, especially in a marriage relationship. Uh, that first one was authority. You husbands and, you know, in authority. We don't like to think of a husband having authority over a wife. And then there's that word submit that we, we trip over and we stumble over. And then you got that word obey. You know, and, and then you have that word master. I mean, is Peter really saying that a wife is to be submissive and obedient to her authoritative husband and refer to him as her master? I suggested once to Susie that she should call me master, and it didn't go over very well. <laughs> and, and I know this is a really tough section of scripture, especially if you are a woman who has dealt with an overbearing cruel, mean, and abusive husband, or if you witnessed your mom dealing with the same type of a man. But before you cover your ears and check out of this message, before you pick up the remote and change to something else, please consider a few important things this morning as it relates to this passage. The first thing you need to consider about this passage is the culture of Peter's lifetime when he wrote this letter was markedly different than today's culture. Markedly different culture. In first century Greco-Roman culture, women were property with little to no rights or respect. Society regarded women as mere servants to their husbands. If you if you picture the poor females that, that live in Afghanistan today under the Taliban rule or live in Saudi Arabia, that was very, very similar to the way females were treated and used and, and thought of in the Greco-Roman world. And so in this situation, if a woman became a Christian and she was thus forsaking the religion of her culture, that decision could result in mistreatment from her unsaved husband. It was a very risky move for a woman to make the decision to follow Jesus when her husband wasn't coming alongside of her. And when these type of conversions occurred, a wife needed to know, how do I respond to my husband now that I'm a Christian and, and, and he is not? I'm reasonably certain that if Peter was writing to wives today who are married to non-believing husbands, he likely would not have used such strong terms as authority and submit and obey and master. Those are reflective of the culture that they were there. The principles would be the same, but my guess is the words would be a bit softer and different. And, you know, these words, they were just not nearly as difficult to the original readers as it is to you and I in the 21st century. And so the culture was, was much different in those days. Uh, here's the second thing you need to consider is consider what submission is not. you got to think about what submission is not. Submission, first of all, is not tolerating abusive behavior. I'm acutely aware of how sensitive this issue of submission in marriage can be. Especially in a world where wives have too often been the object of physical and emotional abuse at the hands of husbands who display nothing of the love of Jesus. And Peter will address husbands in verse 7. Now, I don't believe Peter has any intention of expecting or requiring a wife to endure the abuse of that kind of a relationship. To stay faithful to that type of a marriage. That's not submission. That's intolerable surrender. Peter's not addressing wives here who are in an abusive relationship. He's addressing wives who have come to Christ. But their husbands have not yet followed her to Jesus. And churches today have many ladies who are married to otherwise good men who haven't stepped across the line of faith yet. Peter isn't telling these ladies to submit and obey you know, these cruel, harsh, authoritative husbands. He's telling them, this is how you are going to impact and influence your husbands who have not yet joined this journey with you. 
So submission, number one, is not tolerating abusive behavior. Number two, submission is not blind obedience. N no matter, listen, we learned last week, no matter who is an authority over you, a Christian doesn't blindly obey those in authority. We take what we are directed to do and we consider it in view and in light of the word of God. And if this direction or this command, whether it comes from the government, it comes from a, 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 a boss, it comes from a spouse, whoever it might come from, if it would violate a command or a principle of the word of God, we don't obey it. But, but often we may be directed by somebody in authority over us or who is in the leadership position. And, and we may not agree with that or think that is the best way to go. But we've considered it in light of the word of God. It's not a violation of God's word. It's just something we would do differently. Scripture says that then we are to cooperate and we are to do the best that we can to follow that lead. But we are never, ever to disobey a command of God in order to obey a command of man. Number three, submission is not shutting up and keeping your thoughts to yourself. No marriage can work. No business can work. No church can work. No family can work. If one party won't consider the other party's views. And so in marriage... The spouse with the stronger demeanor is always wise to consider the influence and the perspective of their spouse. Susie's guidance has saved me from a world of hurt over the years. There have been multiple occasions when I have submitted my way in a matter to her way because I had to wise up and trust her perspective better than I trusted my own perspective. Yet in any relationship, when all ideas are presented, again, whether we're talking about marriage, work, church, home life, when all ideas are presented and they're all equally considered, someone has to make the final decision. And when you aren't in the role of the one who is tasked to make that final decision, then as God's children, we are to ultimately cooperate with the decision maker in the final decision. It's not violating the word of God. It might not be what we would choose. But as God's children in that situation, we are to exhibit a cooperative, willing, agreeable spirit. Number four, submission is not an indication of inferiority. Bible is very clear that in Christ, there is no male or female. We are one in Christ. Picture your mind, perhaps, of a, of a quarterback on a football team. Now, there are 11 players on the field for each side. And a winning football team has 11 players each playing their roles on each play. But the quarterback is the one who has to make the final decisions once they're on that field. This doesn't mean he's necessarily the best athlete or the smartest athlete. In many cases, the quarterback isn't the best athlete or smartest person on the field. He is just tasked with coordinating it all on that field. And a winning team understands that they need to follow the quarterback's lead. And they need to follow the quarterback's direction to have the best chance at scoring. So they, all 11 of them function with all of their individual skills and their knowledge under the overarching direction of the quarterback. And so leadership is not an indication, or submission is not an indication of inferiority. Sometimes it just has a matter to do with different roles. Now, while Peter is speaking to wives, specifically here, who have come to faith in Jesus ahead of their husbands, this passion speaks to all of us regarding how we are to influence people in our lives who are not yet believers. And that is a task every one of us in this room shares. Whether you are married or single, widowed or divorced, there are overarching principles in this text that apply to every relationship we find ourselves in. 
And so these directives will allow us to experience a greater impact on unsaved people in our lives. And I think that is Peter's primary objective in this whole section about submission that began in chapter 2. Peter is trying to help us understand how we can equip ourselves so that we are most effective as we attempt to influence people in our lives that God has put there who are not yet believers. And so that's what I want to concentrate on for the rest of our time together. And I'm going to give you four principles that I believe if you implement into your life, you will become more effective in reaching and impacting and influencing people in your life who are not believers. Number one, Respect and cooperate with those people in your life who are tasked to be leaders. Now, remember, in the immediate context of this passage, Peter is discussing submission to all authority in your life. He has just called on believers to cooperate for the sake of Christ with government leaders and with employers, even those who treat us harshly. And Peter next gets to, gets to the situation of wives who are in an unbalanced spiritual relationship. And he says basically the same thing, that you should have a submissive, cooperative, willing spirit toward your husband, even if they are disobedient to the word. Now that phrase, disobedient to the word, at least means those husbands who are not living by biblical principles. But it could also include those who have not personally submitted to the Lordship of Christ yet. See, Peter isn't writing this to put wives in their place. Submission and cooperation has a much greater purpose than domestic order. And, and Peter tells us what that purpose is. He says, so that they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. So that these unbelieving men could be one to Christ, could come to know the grace of our Lord Jesus. Not so much by our words, but by our behavior. So whatever relationship you are in, you're at work and you have a kind of harsh, cruel, or you have a great boss. Either way, you need to be cooperative. You need to be willingly agreeable. You need to function under that person's leadership so that you may have a chance to win them because of your example, the behavior that you exhibit. And so here's the point. A Christian lives a Christ-like life. We exhibit attitudes and actions more than just our words, and that is what will win over and impact and influence those in our life who are not believers. People who might otherwise be hard-hearted toward biblical truth. In fact, Peter says such a person, such a husband will be drawn to Christ by the beautiful behavior he sees in his godly wife. And we saw this same principle last week when Peter wrote about how a Christian is to respond to unfair and harsh government authorities. And about how Christian Slaves in that day were to respond to harsh and cruel masters. And he simply said, show proper respect to everyone. Because by doing good, you honor God and you silence those who are ignorant to the truth of God. See, we Christians, we need to be models of cooperation. We need to be good followers we need to be agreeable people at work, at home, in school, at church, and in society in general. A few years back when I was still living up north, I had a friend of mine who was also uh, a pastor. And we were involved in some mission work together. And, and so he had a meeting at his home. And so I went to his home where a number of us gathered, and I got there a little bit early, and he was showing me some work that he was hoping to do and some construction that he wanted to do and expand the size of his house. But he told me he was running into problems with the zoning committee of his town. 
And then he just started really just laying it into the zoning committee guy and how unfair it was and how he was going to circumvent these zoning rules and these zoning laws because he thought that this was just ridiculous and unfair that the zoning commission wouldn't give him a permit to do this additional construction he wanted. I didn't say much at the time, but I thought, I don't know, is that the way a Christian should handle a situation like this? I'm not saying that you just accept every every answer you get that is not what you want to hear. But it seemed that there was being a, a, a real defiant spirit in that individual at that time. And, and I think just as Christians, we have to understand this, how we respond and how we react to people who are in leadership or in authority over us, that's either going to enhance our witness for Christ or it's going to harm our witness for Christ. And so if you still work, you're still employed, keep that in mind when you go to work tomorrow is how I respond to those in leadership and supervisory positions where I work, is how I respond to that. Is that enhancing my witness or is it harming my witness for Jesus? Number two, be conscious of your inner person. Be conscious of your inner person. Peter's advice to the wife in this difficult position of being a Christian when her husband doesn't share her faith is simply this. Be conscious of your inner person. Instead of emphasizing your outward beauty, such as your clothes and your jewelry and your hair, spend more time, spend more energy developing your inner person, your inner beauty. And isn't that so true for all of us? See, the primary way that you and I are going to impact this world we live in and the people that we come into contact with is to focus more attention on developing our inner life than on wearing the right clothes or having the hair done just right or having the perfect body. And you know, these, these teachings are true whether you are male or female. I know plenty of guys who, who, who invest so much in exercise and so much in, in, in building that right physique, that right body, having those right clothes. Listen, those who emphasize external appearances over internal character have simply chosen the wrong priority. And so Peter, he's pointing his readers to, those, to our internal character, to the internal attitudes of our heart, rather than the external adornments of the body. Because it's the inner character that's going to make a difference in people's lives that you come into contact with. It's not going to be what you wear or your physique. You know what? It takes, if a woman or, or a guy, they're going to a very exquisite, elegant event. It's going to take some time for them to prepare for that. Got to get the hair right, the makeup right, the nails done. Got to get the right clothes. Everything's got to be perfect. The, the, you know, it, it just all has to work, right? Because this is an elegant event you're going to. But it'll take a day or so, a few hours, whatever. But you know what? It takes a lifetime to build an eloquent character. You, you can teach your little girls how to fret over their hair and their makeup and their jewelry and their clothing all the while missing the more important inequalities of modesty and of gentleness, of godliness. Listen, the red car carpet crowd at the Academy Awards, they may not be impressed with a quiet and gentle spirit. But Peter tells us the quiet and gentle spirit is precious in God's eyes. So who are you trying to impress? The red carpet crowd or God? Now listen, this text doesn't prohibit us from styling our hair or wearing jewelry or nice clothes. The point here is this, our outer appearance is not to be our preoccupation. It shouldn't be our main concern because outer beauty and outer appearance has no effect on unsaved people. But a life that is beautiful on the inside, that is developed spiritually, where Jesus and his spirit are just flowing out of our life and out of our character. And people see that beauty inside. That is a life that has great potential to make a difference for Christ in the lives of those we come into contact with. And so be conscious of your inner person. Another way to spiritually influence people in your life who are not believers is emphasize that which will never fade away. 
reason we don't want to put too much effort into outward appearances is they're all going to fade away. You know, here today, gone tomorrow. Remember back to leisure suits and platform shoes? Man, I went to my senior prom in a leisure suit and platform shoes. Remember the big hair 80s when everybody had their hair sticking out to here and had the shoulder pads, right? Oh, here today, they faded away. Thank you. Basketball players of old, you remember they'd wear their shorts tight and real short? And then more recently, they started wearing bottoms that are five sizes too big and hang halfway down their shins. But if you've noticed over the past couple of years, the shorts are starting to get a little tighter and shorter again. Everything comes and goes. They all fade away. But in contrast to all of this is the life that emphasizes godliness and purity because those traits will never fade away. Peter calls it the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. Listen, folks, what the world considers beautiful will always fade away. What the world says is valuable will always fade away. But what is precious to our God is unfading. Jesus told us not to emphasize and pursue earthly treasures because moths and rust destroy them and thieves break in and steal those things. Instead, Jesus said to store up heavenly treasures because those things are forever. So ask yourself this question. What are you investing your life in? Are, are the things you primarily emphasize and invest your life in, are they things that will fade away? Or are they things that are unfading? I had someone tell me this week, we don't have a lot of money because we've given a lot of money away. God bless that attitude. You know what? We each have a choice. We can invest in that which will fade away, or we can invest in that which will last forever. You can spend your money on high-end exercise equipment, on top-of-the-line beauty care products, on designer clothes, and all of that is going to be gone from this earth in time. You can invest your money in stocks and bonds and real estate, but none of that is going to go with you to heaven. Or you can invest in a missionary who is taking the gospel to unreached people groups. You can invest in your church who is impacting your community with the gospel. You can invest in, in organizations that are feeding the hungry and the homeless in your community. Bottom line is, is what do you want to invest your life in? That which fades or that which fades away. And then number four, if you want to have an impactful life on lost people in your lives, take a real interest in others and take the time to get to know them. Take a real interest in others and take the time to know them well. Now, in verse 7, Peter finally gets to husbands. Now, you may wonder, if you look over this passage, why does Peter take six verses to speak to wives and only one verse to speak to husbands? Well, let's face it, you ladies can handle more information than us guys can. And so maybe the reason husbands only get one verse is because... Peter knows that he's talking to guys, so he's got to keep it brief, and he's got to use small words if we're going to get it. You know, my wife can pay attention through six verses. I can pay attention to about four words before my mind starts drifting. So Peter tells husbands, he says, be considerate as you live with your wives. Now, I did some research on this phrase, and, and it's really interesting. Be considerate means to consider your wife. Consider your wife's interests. Consider your wife's life. The idea here is that husbands should genuinely be involved in the life of his wife. That he ought to take an interest in the, in, in the things that his wife is interested in. He ought to become a student and know what makes his wife tick. What are the hopes and dreams of his wife? Listen, as troubling as the words obey and submit and master can be to us in the 21st century, trust me, Peter's words to husbands here, way, way more radical. I, and let me tell you this, no one fought more for the rights and the equality of females than Jesus and his followers. Get that. No one 
fought more for the rights and the equality of females than Jesus and his followers. Back then, husbands would be like, what? You expect me to do what? You want me to be considerate toward my wife? You want me to get to know her? Well, I've never heard such crazy talk. But you know, this principle is not only true in the marriage relationship, but it's true in all of our relationships. How well do you try to get to know people in your life? People maybe you work with, people in your neighborhood, maybe the parents of kids in your school. See, we have learned in the 21st century America, the art of keeping interpersonal contact to a minimum. And of course, that's never been more true than during this pandemic. And it is, it has just kind of exploded the, the, the skills that we have to avoid human contact. So we built privacy fences around our homes. We pull into two car garages. We shut the garage door and we go into the house from the garage. We never have to see or talk to our neighbors. And we're so afraid of interacting with people. We do everything online now. How much interest do you take in the lives of those that God has placed in your life on a daily basis? Is there any attempt on your part to really understand who they are, what their situation and circumstances may be, and what led them to be where they are? And then to treat them with understanding and consideration. I think too often we just pass judgment on people or we make conscious conclusions about someone without ever really trying to get to know who they really are. And I think if we're going to impact those in our lives who have yet decided to follow Jesus, we got to get to know the people that we live with. We got to get to know the people that we work with. We got to get to know the people that go to school with our kids. We got to get to know the other parents on our kids' soccer team. We got to consider them and get to know them. Listen, they may be different from you. Maybe they use foul language. Maybe they're gay or they, they come from a different racial or cultural background than you. It's so easy to just push off people who are unlike us or who think differently about things than we do. And so it's a challenge for us to really take the time to get to know people, get to understand them. Last weekend, I officiated a wedding in Daytona Beach. As I waited for the start of this ceremony, I noticed two ladies who were obviously in a same-sex relationship. After the ceremony was over, pictures were being taken. One of the ladies comes up to me and told me how much she liked the ceremony that I had performed and all the words that I had shared. I thanked her for being so kind and I asked her how she knew the couple. She told me she was the bride's cousin. At that point, her partner joined us and she introduced me to her as her partner. We had a little more small talk and then I went to get something to eat at the hors d'oeuvres table and, and they had standing tables around the patio. So I searched for a table to place my food at to stand and, and these two ladies were already at a table. So I asked them if I could join them and they happily said, please do. I asked them a few questions about their life and learned that they were in their late 20s and they live in Los Angeles. Now, a same-sex female couple in their 20s from Los Angeles is about as different as you can get from this 60-year-old guy from Titusville, Florida. But we had a nice visit as we each shared a little bit about our lives. Well, after a while, I told them that I needed to head out, told them to have a nice evening, and they each shared with me how they enjoyed our time together. And you know, whenever they boarded their plane back to the West Coast, they at least went back, not feeling that the old preacher who officiated the cousin's wedding was condescending, judgmental, or unpleasant toward them. I think it's important that we work to get to know people who God places in our life. And sometimes that's going to require us stepping out of our comfort zones into the uncomfortable. But as we show people respect, they may be drawn ever closer to God, the God who loves all of us and the God who seeks a relationship with each of us. My friends, we've got to keep ourselves open to being used by God to reach unsaved people in our lives. They're in our lives for a very specific reason. 
And the absolute number one priority for every single believer in Christ is that we keep ourselves open and sensitive to the lost people in our lives and how God wants us to reach them. And I believe this is what this passage is mostly about. So if the words submit and authority and obey and master trouble you, I get it. But don't get hung up on those words. See what Peter is challenging us to do. See what Peter is challenging us to be. People who position ourselves by our character and by the way we relate to other people so that we may have the greatest opportunity to influence and impact others for Jesus. Let's stand and let's pray together. God, thank you for the challenge that you have laid before us, God. The challenge to be people of influence and people of impact. I pray, God, that you will help us at this time to just see these wonderful opportunities you give us each and every day as opportunities to influence people for you. God, thank you for every single person in this room. Thank you for their willingness to listen and to, and to just struggle through and challenge with these difficult words, Father, to really see what it is you want us to know. We love you, God. We thank you for making us all one, putting us all on an equal level, whether we're male or female, black or white, whatever we are, God, we're all equal in your eyes because we're all sinners and, and we're all saved by the blood of Jesus. So thank you. We give you the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen.